Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. Have you ever been stuck at a railroad crossing? The longer you sit there waiting for the train to pass, it seems as if the train goes slower and slower, and the train seems to be getting longer and longer. Now, one of the largest passenger trains in the United States was the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus Train, which had almost 60 cars. Now, a coal train ran from West Virginia to Ohio in 1967 that had 500 cars and six locomotives. It's not the length of these trains that stands out to me, unless you're stuck waiting at a railroad crossing. But the effort it takes to get these cars in the correct order and stay connected is remarkable. This process happens at railroad yards across the country, and you'd be forgiven if you've never seen one. They seem to be hidden away just on the other side of a fence or a row of buildings. A railroad yard is a huge area with a series of parallel tracks They're used to unload freight and sort and store cars waiting to be assembled into a train. Now, Each of those cars needs to be connected by a linkage, such as a link and pin coupler. This was the original style used in North America. If you would look at the end of each of these early cars, you would have seen what looked to be a rectangular box with a slot in it. A link, imagine one piece of a large chain, would go in the slot and a pin would be inserted from the top securing that side of the link. The other side of the link would then be attached to the next car. A worker would stand between the cars as they came together, and he would insert the pin at just the right moment into the other hole, connecting the two cars. Now, my description may be hard to imagine, but know that this was a dangerous job. At the least, a worker would lose a finger or two, or maybe an entire hand because they did not get the pin in place at the right time. Some workers were crushed between two cars or would get dragged underneath. It still wasn't a great solution, even if you took out the gruesome injuries and deaths associated with the Lincoln pin system. There was no nationwide standard design, which added time to linking up cars, and as cars increased in size, the Lincoln pin system couldn't hold up. A better link was needed. Andrew Jackson Beard was born a slave on a plantation near Mount Pinson in Jefferson County, in 1849. He gained his freedom when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued when he was 15 years old, and he married his wife Edie Beard when he was 16 years old. They would go on to have three children. Beard and his family took their surname from the owners of the plantation, and even though he was a free man, he stayed on the plantation until he was 18 years old. Beard was a farmer for the next five years, And after a difficult trip to Montgomery to sell 50 bushels of apples that took three weeks, Beard quit farming. It was just too labor-intensive. Next, he became a millwright in St. Clair County where he built and ran a flour mill. But even that couldn't satisfy a man like Andrew Beard. Even though he could not read or write, not even write his name, Beard had a mechanical mind and was constantly tinkering with the tools of his trade and finding ways to improve them. He wondered how he could improve on the common plow that he had worked with for so long. In 1881, he improved and patented plans for a double-blade plow with adjustable blades. He sold the rights to his design for $4,000 just a few years later. Now, to put that into perspective, that would be like receiving over $100,000 today. In 1887, he sold the rights to an even more improved plow for $5,200. From slave to an inventor in a short 17 years was a remarkable feat. Not only did he patent his inventions, but he also made money from them, which is not always the case with inventors. In our season one story about Mary Anderson, inventor of the windshield wiper, she never made a dime from her invention. At the time of his second patent, Beard lived in the Woodlawn area of Birmingham and invested his newfound wealth into a profitable real estate business. Beard was not done inventing. He received two patents for rotary steam engines in 1890 and 1892 before turning his attention to improving the railroad industry. Word of Beard's mechanical abilities had spread, and he had started receiving offers of employment from competing companies. As I mentioned earlier, coupling rail cars was dangerous, 
and there was even mention that Beard was seriously injured and had lost a leg. I could not find proof of this, but I'm sure Beard saw enough injuries that he was moved to improve upon the coupling system. Beard designed what is called a knuckle coupler, also known as a Janie coupler. The Janie coupler, also pronounced as a Jenny coupler, was initially created in 1873 by Eli Janie, and improved versions of this style of coupler are in use to this day. Three of those improved versions of the Janie coupler were designed by Beard. His first patent was granted in 1897, and his improvement was that the couplers automatically locked. This was the first coupler that automatically locked in the United States. His coupler would connect with the existing Janie coupler and was cheaper to manufacture and fix if broken. The same year his patent was granted, the U.S. Congress passed the Federal Safety Appliance Act, making it illegal to operate any railroad car without automatic couplers. Timing is everything, as they say. He made improvements to his design with patents in 1897 and 1905, and he founded the Beard Automatic Coupler Company to market his product. Beard sold the patent rights to his Janie coupler for $50,000, just shy of $1.5 million today. The sales and royalties from his patents and investments in other businesses made Andrew Jackson Beard the first African-American millionaire in Jefferson County. You would assume that he would go on and live out his life in some form of luxury or comfort, but that wouldn't be the case. Little is known about the last decade of his life other than he became paralyzed and impoverished. The 1920 census has him listed as an inmate at the Jefferson County Almshouse. An almshouse was generally a house of last resort for the poor, disabled, and elderly. He died May 10, 1921, and is buried in Greenwood Cemetery in an unmarked grave. Andrew Jackson Beard was recognized for his work and was posthumously inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2006 in recognition of his revolutionary Janie coupler. So the next time you're stuck at a railroad crossing, watching the car slow down in front of you, take a look at the couplers and know that a man from Alabama, a former slave named Andrew Jackson Beard, had a vital hand in creating them. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Alabama Short Stories. If you enjoyed the story, there are a couple of ways you can help the podcast. The first is to tell a friend about the podcast. The second is to buy some merchandise from our store or donate to the podcast. You can find links at alabamashortstories.com. You can listen to the podcast on the website or wherever you prefer to listen and subscribe to podcasts. See you next time at Alabama Short Stories.